Okay, so welcome once again to everybody who's joined us. It's lovely to see uh, all your faces or at least your names, <laughs> those who don't have their cameras on. Um, and welcome to tonight's show. Now, of course, tonight's show, as was advertised, uh, we're going to explore this little known festival called Tu Av, which is the 15th day of the Jewish month of Av. And of course, that is tonight. That begins tonight. And it's a very joyous, as we'll speak about in a moment. Um, but the reason why I, I, I advertised it as you know, the question of the Jewish Valentine's Day, you'll understand shortly as we go through what occurred to make this day a joyous day and what makes it so special. In fact, uh, tonight, sure, of course, uh, because it is Tubav tonight, um, if you were to be davening Shachrit tomorrow morning, which hopefully we will, uh, not necessarily with a minion, of course, but at our homes, you don't say Tachnun. It's, it's a really joyous occasion. But the interesting thing is, and of course why I decided to do a shir on this tonight is, it's probably the most underestimated and probably the most overlooked day in the Jewish calendar. In particular, when you learn about the significance of the day, you'll be surprised as to say, as to see why it is um, such a special day. And of course, it begs the question, it beggars the question, why in fact did it not become as popular as it should be. Now in Israel, as I said, uh, especially in terms of secular Israelis, they do sort of utilize it as a day of, um, you know, Valentine's Day, and it's all about romance and so on and so forth. Uh, but we'll see as to what it's, it, it happened in terms of biblical, uh, Talmudic times rather, not biblical times, um, and what made it such a special day. Now, in fact, you may have heard that when it came to the festival of Tubav, it was when a lot of shiduchim, a lot of marriages took place. Lots of singles, they would attend this great big social event in the vineyards or in the fields. Um, and it was sort of attached to it, this day of annual matchmaking, the day of annual shiduchim were made. So the question is why, but let's just take a look first at the source for this special holiday. It fa it's found in the tractate of Tanit. Uh, if you ever want to look it up one day, Tanit 26b. The Gemara says over there like, as follows. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said, there were no happier days for the Jewish people for Israel than the 15th day of Av, which is tonight, and Yom Kippur. What? No greater day of joy than Yom Kippur. I mean, how many of us are dancing around in Yom Kippur? But let's see. We'll explore and analyze and hopefully give us a bit of a better explanation. And the question is why? So it says that on those days, on the 15th day of Av, the daughters of Yerushalayim, the girls of Jerusalem, would go out dressed in white garments, which they had borrowed in order not to shame anyone who had no beautiful clothing. And look what the Gemara says. The daughters of Yerushalayim would go outside. They would dance in the vineyards. And the Gemara asked, what would they say when they got to the vineyard? They said, young man, raise your eyes and see whom you choose for yourself. You know, obviously there was a row of men and a row of women, and they each had to pick a shidduch. And it said like this, do not pay attention to beauty, pay attention to family. And the Gemara says, it continues, charm is false, you know. Sheker achein hevel ayofi, as we say in the Proverbs, a God-fearing woman is to be praised. So they were trying to find themselves a suitor and everyone was sort of trying to express their qualities and saying don't don't look at the don't look at the physical beauty look at our spiritual beauty also it says go out towards of zion gaze upon king solomon upon the crown with which his mother crowned him and the day of his nuptials and the day of the joy of his sight and the gemara there the sages explain the day of his nuptials is the king of the torah the days of the joy of his heart is the rebuilding of the beta mikdash may it be speedily in our days amen as it says in the gemara so what is the Gemara telling us that this day of Tuba'ab, which we're celebrating right now, which we started tonight, it is the day on which the young maidens would go down to the field. It was such a joyous day where they would find their suitors and it would be a lot of Shidduchim made. Wonderful. Mazel Tov, as I explained uh, yesterday in one of my Q&A, what's so special about Mazel Tov. But it was a very beautiful and healthy day. Now the question is, which we have to obviously understand and explain, Right? What was so special? And more, more importantly, I don't know if you sort of, if something stood out in your mind, but when, it's, when we said that there was no greater days in the Jewish calendar like Tuba'av and Yom Kippur, that would be something which would sort of beg the question as to what do you mean? Yom Kippur is a day of, of joy. Now, amazingly, a lot of people don't realize that Yom Kippur is actually a day which is not supposed to be a sad day. It's not like Tisha B'Av. Although there's a similar, similarity in that we fast for a, a full day and night fast. But Yom Kippur is actually a joyous day. Why is it joyous? Because in Yom Kippur, we get atoned, we get forgiven. And that is the greatest joy that a person can have when we are our teshuva, 
our repentance, our returning to Hashem is accepted. But what's the connection between that and, and of course, between Tubav? And what makes it such a special day? What was so significant about, yes, it's beautiful that there was Shiduchi made. Of course, we know that, you know, marrying young couples together is wonderful. Or even older couples if they're not yet married. Making a Shiduchi is fantastic. In fact, what I tell many of my couples when they stand under the chuppah, I explain to them, you know, that the neshamot, the souls in the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, you know, to leave, you know, to be in Gan Eden, to be in the Garden of Eden, it's not, I'm not talking about the Garden of Eden where Adam was sitting. This is talking about the Gan Eden, the, the upper garden, where your soul just literally basks in the, the glory of God. It's, it's very hard to take that soul out of there. But it says one of the reasons why the soul might sort of travel and leave that Garden of Eden is to go to a chuppah. To go and be by a chuppah, to be seeing two neshamas in this world joined together under chuppah. So, of course, it's very beautiful. But why? Why was that day of Tuba Av selected as a day where these couples got married? Because it's very good to say that it's a beautiful day because of all the Shidduchim got made. But what makes it this day the opportune time for Shidduchim to be happening? And as uh, Esther Bartek just mentioned uh, a few years ago, on this night, her son got married and i was the mc of the of the ceremony of the wedding um f- the wedding party and it was a very beautiful simcha and of course as i said it's a great day to get married many couples do get married unfortunately today to get married in, in melbourne is is illegal <laughs> but uh Bezrat Hashem, soon we'll be able to get married um not those of us who are already married but those who need to get married will hopefully be able to get married soon so what made this day so special so tonight what we're going to look at is a number of things we're going to look at two avenues. The first part of the shiur, and as I said, I'm hoping to get you uh, by 8.40, hopefully we'll be done. Um, but if there are questions, of course, please type them in and I'd be happy to address them. But the first part of the shiur, I want to look at some of the reasons that the Gemara, which we'll see in another part of the Gemara, in the tractate of Tanit as well, later on, discusses what in fact occurred on this day. And once we understand what occurred on this day, I want to take each of those occurrences and translate it into some very crucial aspect of our connection to Hashem. And more importantly, well, not more importantly, but equally, sometimes when we speak about our relationship with our significant other, or if you're not married, your relationship with your friend, each of our human relationships, each of our interpersonal relationships can be reflected in how we relate to Hashem. So how we talk about how we connect to Hashem, you can translate that and extrapolate that into how you connect with another human being, and of course, how you would connect with your significant other. So we're going to look at some of the key components, the key criteria when it comes to how do you have a successful relationship? What are the things you need? So we're, going to look at, we're going to look at five general overview points, and in the second half of this year, we're going to look at one of the factions, or one of the functions, one of the reasons that Tuba Av became so famous which will at, at first glance seem rather strange, you know, in, in terms of the, the particular reasons that made it such a special day and see how that is the one criterion, one, it's one of the key components to having success in any of your relationships that you'll have, as I said, whether it be your significant other relationship, whether it be with a child, whether it be with a friend, even a colleague at work, even a relationship with uh, just, you know, somebody that you work with, et cetera. And of course, how we relate and connect with Hashem. So if you don't know anything about Tuba Av, then tonight's certainly going to be eye and eye opener because you'll get a lot of information as to what in fact this day is about. As I said, a lot of people don't know about Tuba Av. A lot of people sort of unaware what occurred in the calendar in Jewish history, what made it such a special day. If you do know these reasons, then hopefully my interpretation of each of the, fact- each of the factors will give you some uh, food for thought. So let's start. So it says the Gemara, as I told you, that there were no days as festive for Israel as the 15th day of Av and Yom Kippur. So the question is, as we said, what is the reason? What made Tuba Av so special? So we're going to look at a number of reasons and a little bit of history for all of them. Of course, you can go, you can spend a whole shiur on each of these reasons, looking at the historic event and going into much more detail. Reason number one, and as I said, we're going to have to look at how does it relate to relationships. And of course, because of the energy of each of these events, um, I'm not sure if anybody watched the Q&A of yesterday, but what we explain that in this world, what we, when we say Mazal Tov, I explain that it didn't mean good luck, because we don't believe in luck in Judaism, we believe in divine providence, but Mazal, one of the explanations is it refers to almost the astrology of the world. 
that the, 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 the Chagim, the festivals, all have a particular energy that relates to the planets and to the way that the, 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 the astro astrological system works. Um, and so therefore each day and every moment, in fact, there's a particular energy in the air. And it's up to us to sort of tap into and connect to that energy, to that muzzle, if you like. And so, of course, each of these events were probably, they all occurred on this day, not because the, this, this happened and therefore the day became special. But sometimes you might look at the other way around. The energy from Tuba'av that was there from the, the from a Maya separation from the beginning of creation, God obviously instituted this day to have this type of energy. It means that events on this day, you can tap into these types of energy. And that's why these significant events did occur. And of course, why this day is so special. And what does that mean for you and me? It means that if you want to tap into holiness, and as I said, to any of these components that I'll speak about, today's a very opportune time. So tonight, all the way through to tomorrow and until the sunset tomorrow night, there's lots of energy. It's like, I don't know if anybody, I, I certainly didn't play this game, but my kids were into it. You know, they were going around with the, um, their phones. What was it called? Uh, I've just been blank now where they were looking for dragons or, um, oh, I just forgot the name. If anybody knows it, type it in the chat box. But there was, a, there was a game. It was very popular for a while. You have to go find and search for these monsters or dragons. And you, you, you couldn't see them with your, with your physical eyes. You needed your mobile phone to tell you where they were hiding. So in a way, that game can translate into our spiritual Kabbalistic energy. If you could look around and see what energies there are in the world today of oh, Pokemon. Thank you, cousin Greg. That's what I was looking for. It, it, the Pokemon was so famous and so popular that we have Tuba of Man, right? <laughs> Pokemon with Tuba of. That if you look around, you can capture the energy that is floating around the air tonight and tomorrow. So let's start. Reason number one. We said that um, we know that when the Jewish people, unfortunately, when they sinned um, in the desert, when the spies came back with a negative report, we know that the Jews were punished. What was their punishment? They were to spend 40 years in the desert. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know this part of the story that the generation that were part of those spies were to die out. They were not to be allowed to enter into Israel. So anybody from the age of 20 to 60 would die out over those 40 years. So the 59-year-olds and then so on and so forth. The last year of this plague, uh, 15,000 people. Now what happened was it's quite, I mean, it's quite disturbing to be honest. It says that they, would be, they would get ready to die. They would dig their own graves and they would lie inside their graves and they would just, they would just die. So it was the last year, or so they thought, 15,000 people got ready to die, right? Um, so they got, into, uh, they got into their graves, they got ready to die, and they woke up the next day and they were alive. And what, what's going on? So they thought maybe they'd miscounted or miscalculated the 40 years. And so they waited again, and another night, another night. Imagine waiting all these nights from Tisha B'Av, from the ninth day of Av, till the 15th day of Av, thinking you know, you're going to die every day. And finally, on the day of Tuba Av, when the full moon appeared, they realized that they definitely didn't die. And there was the, 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 the sin of the spies, which happened on Tisha B'Av, obviously they had been forgiven. And of course, it was clear to them that Hashem's decree was now over, and they'd finally be forgiven, as I said, for the sin of the spies. So a miraculous day in the Jewish calendar, because, as I said, it was a day after seeing so much death and so much, uh, I, I guess, tragedy, that finally stopped. But I want to, I, I, there's something fascinating to think about. And as I said, we want to try and translate each of these events. So think about this event and think about what is the key factor that comes out of this event. There could be many that you might glean, but the one thing that I take out from this event is really what we call bitachon, trust. Trust in Hashem. Which means, you know, the, in a sense, they were lacking trust in the beginning of the reason why they got into this mess in the first place. The spies went to the land of Israel. And what did they come back? They came back with a negative report. And they said, we cannot do this. So their mistake wasn't reporting what they had seen. Their mistake was saying, we are not able to go and conquer it. And so clearly, at the end of this plague, when Hashem had given them, uh, had accepted their, their tshuva and they had been forgiven, it obviously, in, it obviously applies or implies that they had done what? That they'd regained their bitachon in trust in Hashem. Now, when you think about a relationship, I think this is probably one of the fun fundamental, foundational things you need. Let's talk about it in terms of our relationship with a significant other. If you don't have trust, and in particular when it comes to choosing a shidduch, you know, as we said, today was a very significant 
day in terms of uh, when many, many, many matchmaking events occurred. But think about what, what, is one, what is the one sort of key factor you need to have before you take the plunge, as they say. Not to say that's a bad thing, but before you, before you agree to marry somebody else. No matter how much research you've done, no matter how many years you've spent together, you need a sense of bitachon. You need a sense of trust that Hashem's going to look out for you. Because the relationship, as we know, is so difficult. There's so many factors. There's so many issues that could happen. There's so many emotions every day. And so just to ensure that a relationship survives is a lot of work. And to enter into that partnership with one other person requires bitachon and say, Hashem, I trust you. You know, I've been involved in a number of uh, shiduchim and certainly involved in a number of uh, you know, people calling me to ask me uh, my advice. Should I marry this person? What should I do? How should I? And I always say, you know, of course, you've got to, you've got to, do, you've got to you know, do your research. You've got to make sure that there's chemistry. You've got to make sure that you like the other person's values and you like, you're attracted to them and so on and so forth, all the various things which come along with it. But I said, ultimately, even once you've checked all those boxes, you need a sense of bitachon. And I think it's, as I said, every relationship is, is consistent with how we treat our relationship with Hashem. Ultimately, no matter how many check boxes you have, this world is a very unstable world. You can have everything you, you know, you could be one of those fortunate few who have everything they need, or you could be on the other spectrum. You could have, you could be lacking a lot and you could be struggling. Whichever side you sit on, you need that ingredient of bitachon. You need that ingredient of trusting in something higher and more powerful than yourself. There's nothing greater, I think, to be able to have true bitachon. You know, when, some of the things that I'm envious of, some of the, the great uh, sages of our, of our faith that lived before us, to see the absolute trust in Hashem. You know, it's like the famous um, sort of image that you might have seen. There's a lot of, you know, viral videos about these things where you have somebody sort of stand up and they have to fall backwards and just fall back into somebody else catching them. And you see amazing how children, if you say, you know, when I remember when Ellie is still, you know, he, he can climb on a high bench or a high table and I say, come on, jump into my arms. And he jumps without even thinking about it. And now if I had to get on a thing and somebody says, you know, Rabbi, jump, I'll catch you. So besides for the, the, the worry that I'll, that I'll crush the person to death, God forbid. But let's say even if there was somebody who was so strong who could possibly catch me, um, you know how much trust you need to really believe that the other person is going to catch you? And in, in, in that sense, that's what we're demanding. And that is the first step of Tu Ba'av, that it was a day where Bitachon came back to the world, if you like, where the sin of the spies was, in a sense, over, overshadowed now and was now that we could now have trust in something else. And as I said, I think having trust in, a, in, in, a, in another human being is always risky, right? We are fallible. We're not infallible. We are human beings and we do make mistakes. But having trust in a creator which, which doesn't make mistakes is, of course, much easier. And so if today you can recommit your trust in others. It doesn't mean that you have to blindly accept what other people tell you. It doesn't mean that you can't as I said, do your, do your due diligence, et cetera, et cetera. But I think having that ability to trust is a very, very powerful emotion. And that's the first thing that occurred on Tuba Av. Number two and three events are, are similar in, 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 in principle, as you'll see in a moment. Very fascinating things happen in Jewish history. I mean, you know, we, 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 we as I know in my, in my Jewish day school, where I grew up in Torah Academy, we learned a lot of things, but we didn't spend as much time as I think we should have on Tanakh on the stories of Tanakh. I mean, some of the stories on Tanakh are just crazy. I mean, you can, if you think Hollywood has an imagination, just read a few paragraphs of Tanakh. It's, it's phenomenal. And obviously that's not an imagination. That's, uh, those are events that occurred. First event. We know the famous story of the daughters of Tzlafchad. If you're not familiar with them, they, are, they uh, appear in the parasha. They came to Moses. They came to Moshe. They said, Moshe Rabbeinu. There were five daughters. They came and they said, our father left no sons. At the time when they complained that it, 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 what, what had happened, that daughters couldn't inherit, inherit their father's property, could only go to sons. And they said, that's not fair. What if we have no, if we have no brothers? You know, who's going to get the land? And of course, as we know, their petition was taken to, on high, and Hashem says, Cain, but not Slavchad, Dovrat, so do the, do the daughters of Slavchad speak correctly, and the laws of inheritance changed from that it wasn't only to be given to sons, it could also be given to daughters. Now, the thing is, there was still one sort of, uh, uh, you know, precursor to that. And that was that when there was no sons, these daughters were forbidden to marry somebody else from a different tribe. So they, they were able to inherit the land from their father, 
They couldn't marry. So let's say, because remember, the land was divided at the time amongst all the 12 tribes. So let's say, for argument's sake, you came from the tribe of Dan and you had daughters and you didn't have sons. So now your daughters, so you passed away and your daughters took your land in the tribe of Dan. The law was these daughters couldn't now go marry a, a, a man from the tribe of Naphtali because they were scared that if they now marry the tribe of Naphtali, who's going to inherit that land? The tribe of Naphtali is almost says going to now own it. And so it would be lost from the lineage of their father. And of course, they would then therefore have to, have to marry men from the tribe of Dan. And they were then, of course, uh, it would be, uh, it would be um, a problem in a sense. Now, also, interestingly, many years later, there was the story, I don't know if anybody read, anybody knows, if I, if I say the word, the story of the concubine of Giva. It's a very, uh, very gory story in the, in the book of Judges. Just very, very briefly, because I'm not going to go through this. Whole, it's, it's, a, it's a sure in its own right. But what happened was there was uh, the, the, the people of the tribe of Binyamin didn't behave very nicely. They took this concubine and they uh, assaulted her and all sorts of terrible things. And they took, they actually chopped her up and, and sent her around to every one of the tribes and so on. And at that point, the children of Israel made a pledge and nobody was allowed to marry any of the daughters from the tribe of Benjamin, almost like a punishment. And of course, this was a, a threat of annihilation to the tribe of Benjamin. Each of these prohibitions, so number one, the prohibition of not being allowed to marry outside of your tribe. Number two, that no one could marry from the tribe of Benjamin. When did both of these end? Which day? Take a, take a guess. On the day of Tu Ba'av. Because the people realized that if they kept to their own prohibition, one of the tribe, the 12 tribes could possibly disappear. And almost as to the oath that they'd say, we're never going to marry into those tribes. But they said that that was only for that specific generation and that now had, had been removed. And of course, this was a great day for rejoicing. Why? Because it showed now the achdus, the unity amongst the Jewish people. And really, possibly the vision of daughters of Tzlaf had also now been realized because they had probably envisioned that why should we be penalized even further by not being allowed to marry outside? And so they were allowed to marry now within each and every tribe. Now, this might seem pretty ridiculous to us and say, hold on a minute, what? Jewish is Jewish. Why couldn't they marry other tribes? But it was a serious thing back then. And so for this decree to be removed was a very, very powerful statement. And I think something which was... Um, as I said, significant in terms of our connection with somebody else. And what is that? I think this signifies what we call Avas Israel. You know, one of the challenges of any relationship is the concept of really wanting what's good for the other person. And we will talk about that in, in further detail. But in terms of a more broad concept of Avas Israel, is that it's, it's, sometimes it's very nice to be nice to those that are comfortable with you and those that you're familiar with. Right? What is Avas Israel really? Or how do you really test Avas Israel? Um, loving somebody else and being nice to somebody else. It's where that person usually was not really acceptable to you. Or that person, oh, I don't really like that type of person. They don't really, uh, you know, agree with their, I don't really agree with their philosophy, their, their way. That's where Avas Israel comes in. You know, and that's where the greatness of this concept, because as I said, if you have Avas Israel for your best friend, if you have Avas Yisrael for your brother or sister, it's nice. I mean, Baruch Hashem. But you don't really need a mitzvah to tell you to have Avas Yisrael for somebody that you like already. It's somebody that I said that you have an issue with to push yourself to try and be respectful and nice to that person. That's the real test of Avas Yisrael. And I think these two stories signify things which really, where there was almost this, um, you know, when there was such this classification within, the, within our own people, it was very, very challenging, very, very difficult. And I know, you know, it was interesting last night, for those of you who watched the talk with Dr. Byrne, someone asked him about all the varying groups in the Jewish faith. You know, you've got reform and conservative. And it is tough. It is, you know, we've made these differences. And of course, I'm not going to get in that tonight because it's a much bigger discussion, much bigger question, of course, in terms of how do we define who's Jewish in terms of conversion, all these things. But ultimately, you know, it's, it is hard when there are these divisions. We would be much better off if we, if we could find a way to have Avas Israel to accept each and every one of us uh, with love and with an open arms. But, you know, we will work on that. That's step number two. So, again, first thing that happened on Tubab was Bitachon. Second thing that happened was Avat Yisrael. The third thing that occurred on this day, or the fourth, we've, we've said three events, two were very similar. The fourth thing that occurred is interesting, uh, another interesting historical event. As I said, lots of information tonight. After 
So the, the, the kings and all the drama amongst kings in, uh, in terms of Jewish history, it's phenomenal, it's fascinating. But there was an incident, there was a king called King Yerabam, and he split off his kingdom of Israel with his 10 tribes from the kingdom of Judea, of Yehuda. And what he did was when he split the kingdom, he posted guards, you know, armed guards along, obviously armed with spears, whatever, all the roads leading into Yerushalayim. Why? Because he didn't want people from going up to the holy city for the pilgrimage festivals because he was scared that it's my, these people might undermine his authority. So obviously the power got to his head and he didn't want anyone coming up to undermine his authority. So what did he do to compensate for those he didn't want coming up to Yerushalayim? He set up places of worship along the way, which were basically purely idolatrous. These were in the cities of Dan and the cities of Bet El. And the division between the two kingdoms now really became what we call a fait accompli. And it was literally something that lasted for generations. And it's so sad to think about, you know, here they were, they had the base of Iqdash, they had temples, they had, you know, the revelation of godliness. And yet they found the concept of, um, of division. But what do you think, if I had to ask, and of course everyone's on mute, so I'll have to just assume what you're thinking. But, you know, what do you think was the key factor that led to this King Yeravam doing such a thing? What one ingredient did he have? It, wasn't a, it was a bad ingredient. And I would say he had what we call ego. He had yeshut. He allowed his arrogance to get the better of him. Fortunately, the antidote for that came from the last king of Israel. His name was Hoshea ben Ella. And he wished, he wanted to heal the breach. And so what he did was he removed all the guards from the road of Yushalayim, to, leading to Yushalayim, allowing the people to make pilgrimage again. And this took place on, drumroll, Tu Be'av. Once again, this magical day of Tu Be'av. And as I said in the beginning of this year, it's not just by coincidence that this happened. Because of the power of the energy of that day, possibly from the beginning of creation, there was energy in the day for amazing things to happen. What happened on this day? We said that things of Bitachon happened. What happened? Things of Avas Yisrael happened. And now things of Bittal, having nullification, being able to look past your own ego and say, what's best for the people, not best for me? What's best for somebody else and not what's in it for me all the time? Unfortunately, Ravam saw only in his own arrogance, you know, how do I remain in power? How am I going to retain my power? Whereas the king of Hesheb and Ella, he saw what is the, what is the right thing to do for others. And amazingly, that day ended where now the Jewish people could go up for the Shalash Regalim, which was, of course, a very significant day in Jewish history, that they could do that. So again, another important ingredient that you need for any relationship. You know, think about it. What is one of the significant factors that causes friction between human beings is when you have an ego, when you are arrogant. And we all have, we all have parts of ourselves which at times... The ego comes out, you know, there's, there's no hiding that. I mean, it's, 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 it's what makes us human beings, but it's putting that in check and not allowing it to destroy. You know, so many people get into such horrible fights and, and, and don't talk to each other for years and years and years and years. Why? Because of that ego. If they could just have a little bit of bitter and say, it's not about me, then I can tell you there would be a lot, more, a lot less friction, a lot less uh, machloket, a lot less faribles or, or broigasim, as they say in Australia that would occur in our community. Now, the, the, the fifth event, I'm going to come back to in a moment. I'm gonna to go to the sixth event and then we'll come back to the fifth event, which we'll spend a little bit more time for probably another 10, 15 minutes. But the final event that happened, um, as I said, we'll come back to the second last one shortly. Um, long after the events of the Romans, of course, you know, destroying the base Amikdash, and we know there was a group who went to where to Masada, and they had a, a final stand against the, uh, the Jews, and of course, they were against the, the Romans, and we had the Par Kochba revolt and so on, and they defended the city of Beitar. Crazy things that occurred. Um, there was very, very significant things that happened. Unfortunately, many of them died and perished, and they were killed in the defense of Beitar. And what happened was that the Romans finally gave permission to bury their bodies. Right, because they let they left them unburied, which is obviously, as you know, part of our faith is the the the, the holiness of the goof itself, of the body itself, to be buried straight away. What did they notice when they came to bury the bodies? What miracle was the second miracle that occurred? That the bodies had not decomposed. 
They actually still remained as if they had just, be, had just died at that point. What day was it? It was the day of Tu Ba'av. So once again, energy in the air that this evil decree of the Romans, that they were able to uh, be buried. Amazingly, this story actually, um, one of the things we say in benching, uh, what do we say? Right? We said that he, he, he who is good and he who does good. And we say that that is in reference and was added because of this, that what does it mean? He who, he who is good. It means that the bodies has, have did not compose and does good in that there was permission that Hashem granted permission or, or allowed that the Romans now get granted permission for the um, burial of these bodies. But what did the Jews that sort of were there in defense of Beitar, what did they represent? I think they represented something, something called Mesiris Nefesh. Mesiris Nefesh where you're prepared to sacrifice something of yourself for another person and of course for the creator of the world in the sense of our relationship with Hashem. Now, Mesiris Nefesh doesn't have to be that you have to die. You know, I know that's the traditional meaning of the word, that you literally give up your life, sanctifying God's name. And there were, sadly, uh, many of our brothers and sisters throughout Jewish history who literally had to do that. They literally died, al Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name, um, just, to be, just because they were Jewish. But Kiddush Hashem might simply be what you're doing tonight, every single one of you. You have other things you could be watching. You could be watching Netflix. You could be sitting on the couch, relaxing, having a glass of wine. But instead, you've chosen to listen to a Shi'ur Torah. That's Messias Nefesh. Honestly, you could be doing a number of other things. I know you could say, well, it's locked down. There's nothing else to do. So it's not, so, it's not such a great, don't, 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 don't praise us so much, Rabbi. But it, I, I mean it, you know, it's, it's a cold night outside and you could just, you know, snuggle in bed. And as I said, if you did like watching movies or TV shows, it would be an opportune night to do so. But instead you chose to watch Torah. And that is, I said, a very significant thing. Um, and Messias Nefesh is something which is required in every relationship. You have to give up what you like for somebody else. That is the greatest thing you need to do in any relationship. And that's why, again, on this day of Tubav, that whole concept again shone forth. So we had a number of concepts. We had Bitachon. We had Avas Yisrael. We had Bitul, right, which is nullification. We had... We had, of course, this concept of serious Nefesh. But what I'd like to do for the last 15 minutes or so is to look at the final event that occurred and to understand that this was probably the most significant and I think one which really demonstrates a relationship, not only a relationship with our significant other, a relationship with Hashem, as I said, uh, which is all that this is really truly about. So what happens it was like this. At the beginning of the second temple period, right, so the Jews had already seen the destruction of the first and of course, now having the second base of Mikdash was, of course, an incredible relief for them. It was an amazing thing. But what happened was, unfortunately, the land of Israel was basically totally at waste. It had been destroyed. It was in ruins. And all the wood that was needed to burn the sacrifices, so all the wood needed for this, the Mizbeach, for the altars, and for the eternal flame that burnt right on the altar, it was impossible to find. So what happened each year, a number of brave volunteers would go and bring the wood that they needed from afar. And it was a schlep. They didn't have uh, big trucks, if you know what I mean. A trip which was dangerous in the most extreme way. Because firstly, not, not just every wood could be brought. It had to be wood which was, didn't have worms that had been inside it. It couldn't be damp or cold. And these were all conditions which were ideal for worms. And so therefore, as a result of this particular issue, they had to, what they needed to do was, it needed to be, uh, the wood that would be needed until the following summer had to be collected literally before the cold set in. So the last day that the wood was brought in for storage over the winter months was on which day, which was the, the last day that it could be brought where it would propose no problem? You guessed it, on Tuba'av. So this day was a magical day. It was the final day where the wood could be brought. And it was a very beautiful festive occasion when the quota needed for that year was filled. And they say that this was a big simcha. There was dancing, there was partying, amazing, amazing things that happened. But the question is, right, what made that event so significant? And I said, that's what I'd like to spend the last 10 minutes discuss discussing. Because to have such a, an event with fanfare, including ceremonial break, and they had something called the breaking of the axe ceremony, which gave the day its name. It actually was called the, the breaking of the, of the axe, etc. Um, what, was the, what was so special about this mitzvah? 
And of course, um, you know, as I said, getting firewood is wonderful. It's a nice thing. Um, but if the, if, the, if the event, what do they gather the wood for in the, on, in the first place? It was for what? It was for the sacrifices. So why weren't the sacrifices the big mitzvah of that time? <laughs> why the gathering of the wood? Rather look at the main event. Look at the main attraction. Right? So obviously there's something deeper here that made this event the standout event and the standout reason what I'd like to explain to you tonight. Now, just to go a little bit further into detail, right? After, as I said, when the Jewish people came back after the second temple, the Jewish people were not rich like the first place of Mikdash. During the first place of Mikdash, the Jews were very, 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 very wealthy people. And in fact, there was eight families who supported and supplied wood for the Beis Hamikdash in, in the first year of its uh, rebuilding. And as a reward for this, they, were, they instituted that a date for each of these families and nations should be fixed in the annual calendar, and so each year, another family would go and bring the wood, right? So it was going a little bit further into the detail. So much so was this, this recognition of bringing the wood such a great day that, listen to this, we know that if Tisha B'Av, if the ninth day of Av falls on a Shabbat, you push off Tisha B'Av till Sunday. And then you fast on the 10th day of Av. It happens every now and again. These families who were responsible for gathering the, gathering the wood, they would not need to fast on the 10th of Av as almost like a reward for what they did, for their, for their sacrifice, for bringing this wood, right? And so the question is why? What made it so great? What made it so special that we have to push off a fast for them that they don't have to fast? So the truth, as I said, the answer to this question is really the essence, I think, of Tuba Av, notwithstanding all the other things I explained previously but it teaches you what it means to be in a relationship and it teaches you what it means to be a Jew. In the most, in the most uh, non, you know, where you've totally removed the ego, where you've totally looked at uh, the, the true essence of what a human being and a yid should be. And what is that? Think about it like this. If I'm cutting wood and chopping wood down in the forest, right? What am I chopping it for? I'm chopping it that a Jew who has to come and bring a sacrifice is going to now have wood to be able to go on the altar. When this Jew comes and, and brings his sacrifice, does he even have a clue who chopped the wood? The person who chopped the wood is so far removed from the reality of this person who brought the karban, the sacrifice, that that person who brought is literally just a facilitator. They're not in the spotlight whatsoever, Right my actions to help that other person are totally unrecognized. There's no significance, right? While, I, while I'm out there schwitzing and schlepping the, the firewood, right, and chopping down the tree, I'm not in the base, I'm not in the temple, I'm not going to be anywhere near this, the sacrifice being made. And behind the scenes, I'm just initiating the process that it will allow this other person to be able to do what they need to do. And these families that did, they took time, they took their money, their efforts for someone else to be able to bring their sacrifice. And here comes the, the million dollar question. How do you know if you're truly committed to someone or to a cause? How do you know if you're truly committed to the Abishta? To How do you know if you're truly committed to God? How do you know if you're truly committed to your significant other? A question which we should surely all be looking at in Tuba of. And the answer is, when you do something for that, that somebody or for that cause without the need to be in the limelight, right? If you can remain in, this, in the, back, the background scenes, chopping wood, content with the knowledge that what I'm doing is helping another person, this experience is what it, was, what it meant to be a real yid, where you could do something just out of the, 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 pure, the pure essence of chesed of doing kindness for another person. Right? It's about you know, my true dedication and commitment behind the closed doors. And the 15th day of Av demonstrates this ultimate devotion that a Jewish person can have to his God and to our fellow Jews. To act so selflessly, if you think about it, without, you know, without the need of gratification and to do so with true joy and happiness is incredible. No other day and no other event can I surpass this. Remember we said there's no greater day of joy for than, than Tuba Av? And what happened was this wood event. But what happened more significantly was when the day when we, we made couples. What were we telling the couples on Tuba Av? If you really want to find a significant other, if you really want to be a true partner to another human being, recognize that you're doing it just for them. You want what's good for them. 
And, and in a sense, you know, when we talk about romance, right, um, or Yom Kippur, remember we said, what's the connection between Yom Kippur and Tuba'av? Now we can understand it in a way, right? The, this, this, this ability to be ready to do something for another person means you have to tap into the true essence of yourself, to your neshama, to your soul level. What happened on Yom Kippur? We're tapping into the soul level too. And so Tuba'av is demanding it and so is Yom Kippur demanding it. Now, again, utilizing this, uh, this concept of romance and marriage, right? In marriage, and for those of us who, who are married, those of us who have been married, we know that there are times where you need to be a woodchopper. <laughs> Unfortunately, you need to be a woodchopper, right? Unfortunately, there are some couples who cannot truly deal with the success of their partners. It really bothers them, right? If you're compelled to sort of stifle the other one, you, 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 want, to, you want to try and uh, you know, surpass the other partner, that means you're not really in a, in a beautiful and, and harmonious relationship. There is a level now, you could be in a nice relationship, but there's a level where you could go up to a point where it might even be better what I described, but still not ultimate. You can be happy for someone's success, but you also want credit for it, right? As long as you acknowledge that I was the person who chopped the wood, then I'm okay, right? That's getting a little bit warmer, but it's not, it's not what we need to, it's not the ultimate, right? I must get credit for not getting credit. You know, a lot of people I want to get credit because I'm not getting credit, right? I'm going, I, I, want to be, I want to be listed as the most humble person. You're already missing the picture as if you start to say things like that. So I want to ask each and every one of you, and of course you're all on science, you don't have to answer the question. But have you ever done something significant for a friend, for a partner, a spouse, that they don't know that it came from you? Right? Think about it. Have you ever done something for somebody else that's a really generous thing that they or nobody really knows that it came from you? It's a tough question. right? Because as I said, even, even somebody who wants to donate anonymously, they're obviously telling somebody that they're donating anonymously. right? But then again, you have some people who do donate anonymously who don't want anyone to know about it or they just tell one person about it just you know, to facilitate the giving. That's incredible kindness. They don't want the credit. They just want to help somebody else. And the truth is, this is what Tubav demands. Can you truly celebrate the opportunity and success for somebody without them ever knowing that you were the one who helped them in the background? You know, can you, can you remain in the forest away from the limelight and cut wood so that another Jew can go to the temple and celebrate their connection with God? That was the greatest of this day. You know, hanging out in the forest when your spouse goes to grow and blossom and do all sorts of amazing things and reach their deepest potential... That's incredible. Now, where's the one place where we see this really in, you know, magnified is when it comes to how we relate to our children. You know, and this is, of course, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule, but on, on the most, we do things for our children without seeking any limelight, right? You do absolute crazy things to help your children and there's nobody watching. You know, you get up at night when they're babies and you help them and you schwitz for them and you work for them. And you don't walk around saying, look what I did, look what I did. No, it's who you are because that's the natural, you've got that natural connection and love. And that's the experience that we're trying to recreate, of course, in a different format. And so that's what it means. You know, we, we want acknowledgement from our wives and our wives want acknowledgement from us. Um, and of course, we want to challenge ourselves that we want to reach a much higher place where I'm truly thrilled to be happy for you just because you're happy. No other reason. I want you to be happy, not because it makes me feel happy or because I want to be recognized for making you happy. That's what the real essence is about. Not what I do above the radar, but what I do under the radar and what's in the intimate space of my heart. I want to connect this finally with a, an interesting teaching from Perkei Avot, which I think uh, relates quite beautifully. In the tractate of Perkei Avot, the Gemara explains over there, um, it says in Perkei Avot, that 10 things were created at the twilight of Shabbat Eve. And it goes through a list of things and it says there as well as the original tongs for tongs are made with tongs, right? How do you make tongs? You need to put them in the fire. So how, how do the original first tongs get made if you don't have any tongs to take them out of the fire? So the Gemara says that Hashem made the original tongs, right? Because as I said, to hold the metal in the fire, you need to have tools to hold them. So the question is, does Hashem really need to make the first pair of tongs, you know, to make another pair? 
Besides for the fact that he can use a mold and it's, is it you know, so important just before Shabbos, what's the back of us telling us that Hashem made tongues for tongues? But the answer is, at a spiritual height of the week, Hashem himself presents tongues. What does it mean? He presents an item for serving no purpose other than helping out to create something else, to help something else. The first set of tongues, which were there to create the first, the, the next set of tongues, its entire purpose was just there to go and help another set of tongues be created. That is the, the concept. You know, I remember uh, thinking about something uh, about two about a number of years ago. And I thought, what's the, what's the, um, the modern day example? You know, I, I once, I, when I was in Doncast, I used to give a Monday morning shiur there. And always I would ask um, the secretary of the show on Friday, I would give her the different things to, to, to photocopy for me. And I remember one day sitting in the shiur and I had all these photocopies and I handed them out and I stopped and I said, I just want to tell you, everybody, I want to thank, and I, I said the lady's name who was working in the office for printing these. And she wasn't there, but I did relay it to her afterwards. And she was so rude. And she said, why, do you, why did you do that? And I said, you know, because I was thinking about it. You have, no one has any clue that you were involved in this, right? When I sit there, I get all the glory. I'm the one who's giving the shiur. I'm handing out the papers. It's all me, me, me. But who actually went and helped me present the shiur with the paperwork? That was you behind the scenes. And it reminded me tonight when I was thinking about the shiur, that that was the paper choppers or the wood choppers. They, they were there to facilitate that something amazing could happen, but they didn't want the limelight. Yes, they were celebrated. Yes, they did, you know, people appreciate it, but ultimately they didn't do that originally for that. And so Tuba Av, again, the power and that energy is there for us to tap into. Tap into the, 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 the depths of your heart, the depths of your soul to say, hold on a minute. When I look at the person that I want to be in a relationship with, or the person that I want to grow my relationship with, ask yourself, how can I find a space in my heart to truly be happy for them just for the sake of them? Not, nothing more. I don't need to do it because I want them to say thank you for doing it. As I said, you know, as, as John said, like the, fam the famous sage who was famed for his or her humility. And so tonight is that night where many shidduchim were made. And now we understand why. Because it was a time to tap into the energy of finding a place in your heart or you can look at someone and say, I'm going to embark on the most beautiful journey of life and also one of the most challenging journeys of life. And in order to make this successful as possible, we need to tap into a tuba of energy. We need to have bitl, we need to have humility. We need to have avasi shrol for each other, we need to care for each other. We need to have bitachon, trust that we trust each other and we trust the one above. And of course, we need to have the ability to be willing to go behind the scenes and do things just for the other person because that means we're coming from a really really powerful place in the human heart and soul if you can do that for another human being it means that you've really tapped into something so powerful so i want to bless each and every one of you tonight on tuba of let's all utilize the day let's all utilize the energy to understand the significant events were not just random there was energy that occurred in those times that those particular events happened to tap into and that's what created this most joyous day. And as we said in the beginning, there was no greater joy for the Jewish people as Tuba Av and Yom Kippur. And hopefully tonight's shiur has given you some understanding as to why that in fact was the reason. So I'm going to stop the shiur here with the recording and then I'll open it up for any questions if there are any. Um, and join me next week, Tuesday night for the next shiur. I don't know what the topic is yet. I will advertise it in the next day or so.